Okay, so this week's Parsha, friends, as we are aware, is the story of what's called Balak. Balak had been appointed, had been appointed the king of Moyov, although he was a Midianite. That's a story in its own right. And the bottom line is the Moabites are afraid of the Jews, although the truth is God had said, and they knew this, uh, that they were not to antagonize even, or not to, not to conquer the Moabites, or even antagonize them. Nonetheless, they sought their destruction, and they realized that the power of the Jew lies in the spirit or the mouth. So they hired the world's renowned sorcerer, Bilam, to curse the Jews. Bilam already had a track record of successfully casting curses upon nations, bringing about their downfall, as Rashi tells us. And Bilam was uh, the inverse of Moses. He was on that caliber of, of spirituality, but of course in the opposite direction. So we read as follows in verse chapter 22, verse 21. Bilam ba So he was, he was reluctant at the outset to accept, accept the job. They pr- promised him a fortune and uh, honor and fame and so he agrees so he gets up early in the morning and he he straddles he uh, loads what's the word there's a word for this straddles that's the word his donkey the obvious question is i mean that's detailed that we have to know we have to know that he's tried he straddled his donkey or even that he got up early in the morning, just he went, is enough. What time of the day and how he did it is uh, immaterial. So Rashi explains why the Torah points that out. Vayachavish, it's an obvious question that a child would ask, and therefore Rashi is compelled to offer an explanation, which he does. <laughs> and he says, Rashi quotes the words in the verse, Vayachavish is a sonoy, and he straddled his donkey. Rashi says, Mikan, from here we learn Shasina, that hatred, Mikalkelet es Hashura, perverts the straight or the ordinary line or the ordinary path of life. Out of hatred, a person does things that uh, are, not, are not befitting or normal. Shechova Shuba Atzma, he himself he had no lack of servants, and these people were hiring him and they would do it for him. They provide him with an entourage, and he himself is straddling his own donkey. <clears throat> Presumably, out of his eagerness, he hates the Jews so much, he's not waiting for anybody to do it. He, you know, straddles it, and he's off to curse the Jews out of his hatred. Although normally a man of his stature, and again, under the circumstances in particular, that he's provided for with all of his needs, would have uh, an, escort. an escort, or say servants, servants, slaves even, to do so. Omar HaKadosh Baruch, sorry? Where do we learn out that he hates the Jews? We know that, that the Moabites hate him. How do, where, he's a hired gun, right? He's just a guy who's been given a contract to... Well, he's going to, <coughs> his, his intent is to wipe out an entire population. So. But, he didn't, but he didn't want to do it. Like, uh, he really didn't want it, to do only it. Because he, he, felt only, he was only bribed by, reluct- by money and yes. fame, and like you said before. But his reluctance was not out of, how can you do this to an innocent people? It's just not going to work. I won't be successful. That was his only protest. And even when God, and even when God told him, yeah? The one thing that bothers me about the whole story is, yeah. you have a nation that's not safe to Jews. Let's say the previous nations that he cursed nation that at that point in time doesn't deserve to be punished just because of one God person who has some connection with God gives a curse that would be enough to create so much suffering among people just because he Ex- right well that, that's it? yeah that's the point that Pilum was saying he said I don't see an opening here that's it that's what he's saying I won't be successful I cursed the the, the it was the I don't want to say then Rashi brings this other nation and they fell because, as you say, they were deserving of it anyway. But that's precisely his point. I'd like to do this, but you know, these people aren't that terrible. Uh, that any curse would work. I mean, even when God tells him, 
um, at the very outset, you want to go, go, but you're not going to be able to, God tells him, you won't be able to do other than anything that I tell you, he still persists. Maybe I'll find some break, somewhere to do some damage. That's real <laughs> hatred. That's, that's, so, that's, again, it's like, as you point out correctly, that's why he resisted, only because he felt he would not be successful. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, Dylan, wasn't he one of the advisors to uh, Pharaoh? And didn't, wasn't he the one who said, when, you know, when they were going to test <coughs> Moses with the, with the lump of uh, coal. coal? And the glittering, yeah, that's correct. He was one of his advisors. And he was the one, because the three of them said different things. Right, and Bilaam was the one that said to drown. Not mistaken, he's the one that said to to drown all firstborn because he could see. Well, the stargazers saw that the, his the downfall of the Jewish redeemer would be through water. They didn't see what you know yeah. clearly, but they yeah. saw it, and there was. Which ties in with last week's. Yeah, worship. yeah. So here he is because of his hatred, going along with this, even though he doesn't see how it's going to work. God tells him, "It's you know you're, you're powerless." He's still going to attempt to inflict damage. So that's why he is straddling his own donkey. Omar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem said to him, as it were in heaven, um, we don't know, it doesn't mean necessarily that God actually communicated this, but God declared more or less, Russia, a wicked one, Kva Kadmucha Avram Avihem, you've been preceded by Abraham, their forefather, in terms of someone who got up early in the morning and straddled his donkey. Shanam, as it says in the story where God had commanded him to, right? Offer Yitzchak. Yitzchak, yeah. Avram Baboke. They're very the same thing, virtually the same words. And he got up early in the morning, Vayachavosh et Chamara, and he straddled his donkey. So you've been preempted by Abraham. So that's what Rashi says. And it's problematic, and here's why. Problematic in the sense we need to understand what Rashi is saying, and we will. Let's see the question. Tzorich Bir. We have to understand this commentary of Rashi, which of course comes from our sages. What's the question? Let's look carefully at the, at the, 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 the words here. Mikach, from the fact. What, what, what does God declare in response to Bilam uh, getting up early and straddling his donkey? God says, you, O wicked one, Abraham, their forefathers, preceded you. End quote. Mashma, what's the inference from that? The inference is Shechavisha Aton Adide Bilam Batsmo. The fact that he got up early and straddled his donkey, Haisa Suyali Hashem Lishuto. That is something that it's a merit. That's a good thing. That's a meritorious thing. That's a, a virtuous thing. Ubakach le Sayel Ub Matarato la Kalel at Israel. And why is he doing this? And that and that merit, come no, that merit would be something that would stand him in good stead to be able to carry out his nefarious desire to curse the Jews. Ella, so God says it's not going to work. Why won't this merit stand you in good stead? Because you were preceded and neutralized by Avra. Ella Shauvda, the fact, Shekvakid Muchav Ramba Vihem. The fact that Avram, their forefather, preceded you, Sikhla, that negated or that neutralized, at Kavana Zusha Bilam, this intent that he is seeking to garner merit. And the question is, what merit is there here? <coughs> the matter is extremely puzzling. How could this act that he gets up early himself and straddles his own donkey? Shein Ella bitterly sinned. It's only expressing hatred, as Rashi himself says. Mikan, from here we see Shasinam kalkelatet Ashurah that hatred makes people do things which are unfitting. How could that be lechashev lechutoshel bilam? That's considered a merit, and God has to counter it by saying what? It's not going to work for you because you were preempted by Avram. It's no merit to begin with. What does this mean? Now, it points out that in, in footnote twenty-two. that the source of Rashi is a little bit different. If you look at the source of Rashi, which is in the Medesh, I'll just tell this to you orally. So there, the Medesh adds a word in describing Bilam's behavior. It says he did so with alacrity. 
The lactrity. Purpose. No, lactrity means <coughs> zizus means, like means a, uh, a quickness. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, sorry. Very clear. No, 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 no. Sharpness. He did very it very. Sharp. Uh, Zizus mean well. I, I'm not sure you know what the English word is. Just a word I know in its translation <laughs> for the Hebrew words. I'll tell you what the Hebrew word means. Zizut means when a person gets the job done as soon as possible and with great efficiency, without delay, the first possible opportunity. <coughs> I think it's what lack of really means. That means you, you, but it means in time. It's a time thing. That you did it. You do it at the first opportunity. There's no wasting a moment. Precision also in time. Okay. Now that's a virtue, you know, and not being lazy is a virtue. So the the the, the medrash adds that word, and God says, "You are vir- you, you're showing alacrity, or well, you were preempted by Avram's alacrity." That makes sense. That one word, we don't have s- such a problem. So our, que- the, our question, Rashi, get, becomes stronger because his source is the medrash. The Midrash is not problematic. He changes the, mid, the Midrash, deletes that word Zrizut, and just points to saddling the donkey. Now that's purely hatred. There's nothing virtuous about that, that you saddled it and not your servant. So our question stands much stronger now, realizing or looking at Rashi's source. The source of Rashi is the Midrash which says, where God says you're showing the virtue of alacrity, which is a good thing, you know, get the job done early. But that would be being preempted. So it's still, the question isn't so strong considering if we look at what? The Midrash. But Rashi changes that and drops that word and says it's only about the saddling of the donkey. Where's the virtue there? That has to be preempted? Very strange. The Rebbe was Answer. Like huh? The Rebbe was like that. Blackie. Yeah. I'll do it Monday. Why not start now? You see it over and over again when people, alacrity, Brisk, so that's brisk, and cheerful readiness. Yeah, brisk. So again, brisk like, implies but, yeah, quickness, right away. Quickness, yes. right away. Okay. She accepted the invitation with alacrity. Right Immediately and cheerfully. Eagerness, willingness, readiness. <clears throat> All right, the, word, the time factor isn't as obvious there, but that's what the, the Hebrew word means anyway. So you turn the page, it's, it's on the inside of the next page. Vyesh Lama, the Rebbe suggests a very novel understanding of what this, you, you got it there, that's it, just, yeah, the insert, no, it, it is there, it is there, it's that one, yeah, just, same, flip side of that page. Vyesh Lama, Vyesh Lama, the narrative tells us, Shekesh Bilam no Chach Ladat, when Bilam, I actually made reference to this before, uh, somewhat, the story, the narrative is clear that when Bilam be, uh, 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 becomes aware, because God told him, God tells him at the outset, and it's very clear, God will not let him curse the Jews. Why did he persist? He continued. Why? He tried this this way. I will, I will point out their flaws. I will be accusatory. And I will mention and expose their sins. In the hope, in that moment of divine displeasure, I'll find an opening to be able to curse him. That's his now modus operandi. He's going to look for an opportunity to expose some failure or shortcoming or sin. And at that moment, the divine displeasure to whatever degree is going to be successful, be aroused, then you'll be able to inflict, if not complete damage, something. In brackets, Kedivri Rashi Lepasuk Rashi points this out to us. Vayar Bilam, and Bilam saw, Kitov Beinei Hashem Levarechet Yisrael, that God was disposed then towards blessing the Jews. So what did he do? Vayashes El HaMidbar Panav. And he turned his face to the desert. What does this mean? He turned his face to the desert. Rashi explains what the verse means. If he wants or doesn't want to curse them, I will mention their sins. And the curse, because I mentioned their sins, will fall. So he wanted to invoke some kind of sin, as Rashi explains in the details there. So bottom line, what we see from here is, what is his, what is his uh, plan? His plan is to 
point out flaws or, or sin. Outright curse will not work, but find a breach somewhere. Now that's what's going on here. The, 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 the desert thing? Is that coming could, up? He, he, because Basically. of some sin that they will do in the future there. Oh, for who had din bin and that's the same case uh, in our case over here. Kavanatol shall His intent. This is a novel insight here. Shechavasheta ason ba'atzmo That he himself. Uh, uh, what's what I used? Saddles. Straddle. Straddles. 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 No, maybe his saddles, I think, no, actually. Yeah, yeah. To straddle means to just simply to spread over. You have the saddle on, then, you then you straddle it. But he saddles the donkey. The There's another word for it. Horse lover as I am, I should know. Okay. The fact that he himself saddles the donkey, out of his anger, Mishum, as Rashi points out, hatred, here's a bold print. What does it do? It makes a person act crookedly, not behave in the befitting way. What does he mean with that? He wanted to hint to God, They have been crooked so many times in the desert and in the history till now. Many times in the desert. That's what he's trying to do. It's this very act of behaving untoward. He's hinting, that's who they, that's what they're doing. How does he know that? He knew the history. Everybody did. And it wasn't history. It was happening right there. And that in so doing, he wished to arouse an accuse, accusation and to be critical, and therefore to arouse, God forbid, God's anger. So that's the answer. Mm. Uh, we couldn't understand Rashi at all. Rashi is saying that he acts crookedly and God says, you, you wicked one, God, or that's what had been preempted. You don't have to preempt an act that itself is no virtue. If it's like the method says he acted with alacrity, all right, that's a virtue. God says preempted. There's no virtue here. Now we understand, no, that's not what's going on. What Bilam is doing is he's acting crookedly in order to arouse, and they act crooked too. That's what he's saying with that. Therefore, let me do some damage. And what's God's response? And therefore God says, Rasha, you wicked one. Abraham, Avram, their, forefa- their father already preceded you. What is God saying? The merit of Avraham. That he himself saddled his own donkey. In the story there of the binding of Yitzchak. Why did he do that? He behaved crookedly too. But what crookedly? Not crookedly below what's right, but beyond. A virtuous kind of not normal behavior. Rashi points out over there the very same thing, but in the inverse. Love perverts the normal path. He shouldn't have done that. He had servants. Why is himself doing this? His love of God. He gets up early in the morning and he himself saddles his donkey. So God's response is, you're pointing out their crookedness in their moral behavior. Well, the merit of Avram's virtuous crookedness, Bilam is saying they're going below what's, or they're veering, you know, left of whatever metaphor, the straight path. And God is saying, yes, but Avram gets canceled that with his merit by veering above what is the normal path. That's the conversation here. So Manami Rosh, so God's saying, not going to work. This will prevent at the outset the possibility that the kitchug, atidi, for any future uh, even accusations, based on the, which will be based on the fact you want to point out their crookedness, well, they got the merit of Avram, whose crookedness in the virtuous sense, going above the law, above what is normal, will protect them. That's what's going on here. So he's trying to arouse through his behavior, trigger a critical a view of the Jews, and God says, wicked one, it's not going to help you. Abraham preempted this by his crookedness in the virtuous sense. So that balances it. Now the message. So Bilam was kind of, he knew what Abraham had done. He was emulating Abraham, but he got the, but he got, he didn't get the point. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, he, 
may even may not have known. He may not have known what Avram did. He may not have known that. He simply wants to show in his crooked behavior to trigger the Jews our crooked bunch. And God's answer is that this crookedness was preempted by a virtuous crookedness, meaning above the law, by the forefather. There's no indication that he knew that. And so God is telling him, it's not going to work for you because they have merit, great merit, that stands them in good stead. Even if they do veer, but they got great merit that will protect them. So it won't work. Again, he may not even have heard this conversation. God is just declaring this in heaven. It's not going to work for you. Keep on going. They're protected. No, I was just curious that he's, he's basically, he's, he's copycatting Abraham. Turns out that he is, but yeah. he, I mean, there's no indication that he knew that. Okay. Because if he knew, he probably wouldn't have, because he would have understood that that merit would count, would cancel his. Maybe he did. Probably like, wouldn't. Like Haman, you know, who tried, who thought he could use our, you know, our system to, you know, and then God said, "Oh no, you got it wrong with motion, I don't know. I'm Perhaps. just thinking that's what he's trying we, to do. He may. We don't. We, we don't have indication of that. It's possible. In our history, we tried the same thing, and just they miss the point. They always miss the point. Yeah. He just okay. doesn't know that he's going the opposite way. Yeah. To Abraham. Yeah, well, he's saying he did know. So the jury's out here again because there's no indication one way or another. Could be. Okay. So what's the lesson we have here in the service of God in the, in the light of the teachings of Chassidut? Le'itim, sometimes, on a personal, individual level. Are we clear? In the, we've explained the Rashi. What, what's, the, what's the virtue in, in, in saddling the donkey? He wants to arouse a critique of the Jews. All right. So now, on a, on a spiritual level, sometimes a person is in a situation where hatred perverts or corrupts the line. The line meaning the, the straight and narrow, the normal path. What's that? Hayitzara, we all have a bilam within. We have a yitzara, an evil inclination. Bisinatola yitzatov. The yitzara, the evil inclination, because of his hatred to the good inclination, will a cold of Asher Bedusha, and the yitzara. Hara hates everything holy. Machshil et adam bechet. He causes a person to sin. Vegorem lo lekalkel et shirat adin, and he causes the person to pervert the the right path. You know the path of Torah. Say the dvarim haraui, the normal path of piderech haTorah, according to the way of Torah. So how do you fix that? A person sinned, in other words, he veered, he acted crookedly. So how do you get back on the straight and narrow? Hatikun lekach is going the other extreme, the mirror. Be'emtsa'ut a'ava mekalkelet ashura. To fix sin, next page, shin samaches. He has to do what? In bold, express a love of God that goes beyond, that is crooked in the virtuous sense like Avraham. So this brings the example, when you have a sapling, and it's, and it's uh, growing crookedly. It's not enough just to bring it like this. For some time at least, you've got to go the other extreme, and then you'll end up straight. So, In other words, the Rebbe is saying, the answer to sin is not to, okay, not simply, I won't do that anymore and go back to the straight path. You've got to go to the extreme in holiness. Avram <laughs> is the match for Bilam. It's got to be a love in brackets that goes beyond the letter of the law. Beyond the limitations of one's personal nature. Like we learn in Tanya, quote, when a person does tshuva, and again, love, that's the word used to describe Avraham. His love of God made him do that which is beyond the mandate. He himself, in carrying out the divine will, um, Uh, it establishes his own donkey. So a love, it's just it's the next page. Chitshuva mi ava mi umka deliver a love out of uh, uh, sorry chuva out of love from the depth of the heart. Bi ava rab according from Tani with great love the chasheka and desire and nefesh shekaka and a longing soul. The davka boit barech to cleave to him. That is yesh bakoch that has the power. To completely fix the sin. And not only to fix the sin, but even to restore, to return, to restore to the realm of holiness. This divine sparks, 
Shenaflu that fell, Birshuta Klipa, to the realm of unholiness, they were captured by unholiness through the sin, they can be redeemed and made holy again. Bem Achet, which were done through the sin, because this kind of Teshuvah out of love, Zdonot Naselok Yisriot, the deliberate sins now become reckoned as merits. So you're saying there's two kinds of Teshuvah. One Teshuvah is you veered, just go back to the straight path. It's not enough. If you go this way, you've got to go that way. And going that way will actually redeem, not just from now on, you know, it's going to be, you won't be punished, you're disassociated with that behavior, and, you know, your, your slate is clean. But the fact is the damage was done. But the higher level to Shuvah is able, is able actually a, able to retroactively transform that damage and make it positive. That's the incredible power of Teshuvah out of love, passion and desire as opposed to just a resolve not to repeat and just to go back to the straight path. That's the message here. That if we really want to transform the crookedness in the negative, it's not enough to go back to normal behavior. It's got to be crazy in the, in the virtuous sense and a passion in the service of Hashem, and that will actually transform it. Shtustik Tusha. the folly of holiness, exactly. And about this level of, of love, this is a high level of Teshuvah, Nemar, that's what the, the uh, Hashem is telling, declaring, as it were, in heaven, you've been preceded by Avram, their father. What's the point here? Avram, their father? They were saying now a new thing. It's not only that his merit stands them in good stead. He's their father. And father means we inherit this quality. Even if they will be crooked, they'll do tshuva like Avram did to this extreme and transform it. Sin doesn't define them, God is saying. They're in their DNA, they're the children of Avram. And Avram served in this transcendent beyond the letter of the law out of love because he's their father sooner or later they will also do tshuva so you want to say they're a rotten crooked people they may veer but it doesn't define them they're children of Avram a very powerful thing here and this is in fact a halacha the halacha in Rambam is at the end and the prophets all say this in the end every, do, every Jew will do tshuva Al-Treba adds either in this lifetime or the next but at the end bal yidach mimenu nidach we will. Why? Because not just little me invested in me is Avram and all our forefathers and patriarchs and matriarchs. All of their great achievements are invested in us and work within us and inspire us sooner or later to not just come back to the right path, but to do so as they did and do and serve God out of this great passionate love. As you conclude, Shekin HaKoch L'Avazu, the Koch, the ability for this great level of teshuva, nimtze b'chol adam Yisrael, every Jew possesses b'yerusha me'avram b'avino as an inheritance of Avram, our forefather. And that's the deep response here. You're pegging them as a crooked people. That's true. They did this. That's not who they are. Isn't, yeah. that, isn't that what our enemies have done to us throughout the ages? Yeah. They've always accused us. Like, and there are Jews who do bad things, wicked things. And... But our enemies always point to that. <coughs> they try to exp- and, and try to convince themselves and the world that Jews are indeed wicked. Yeah. And so Hashem is saying it's a temporary behavior. Invested in them is Avraham, and not only will the sinner come back to the right path, but moreover he'll transform his sins by going to the other extreme. Yeah. All right, now the next next thing. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah. We do. So, next quote. You have it there. So, at the end, he tries to curse, but instead of curses, what comes out, of course, are blessings and wonderful prophecies. One of them is Mi mana afar Yaakov. Who can count? This is what Bilam is saying much later in the narrative, the story. Who can count what? Afar. Afar means the, the earth. What kind of, what kind of uh, praise is this? Who can count the earth of Yaakov? Next page. Just turn the page. On the inside of the next No. No, the, the first one. Go back. It's in. You just, it's the next side. It's the next side of your page. 
There's two, two of them. It's, it's the next side of your page. You just have to... <coughs> so Rashi explains, what's he talking about? Earth? What kind of, what's the praise here? Ein chesh... Ein chesh bon be mitzvot, there is no, who can count, means what? There is no... If you say something, who can count something, you're saying it has no... No limit. Right. Ein chesh bon be mitzvot, there is no calculating the mitzvot. Cheshma means a calculation. Shem bekaimin be'afar that the Jews observe with the earth. What's that? Lo sachros b'shor v'chamor. The Torah forbids the plowing of an ox and a donkey to be harnessed together with in the earth because the ox does more work as it pull whatever the reason. Lo sizra kilayim. You're not a, not allowed to plant in the earth. Uh, seeds of different like, species. species. And then afar para, then there's the earth that needs to be mixed into the potion of the red heifer. Afar sota, and the sota that is, has to drink the potion to determine her innocence, hopefully she has to drink a potion that the earth of the Mishkan is mixed into it. The kayotzebem and other laws. So that's what he's saying. The Jews have all these in his praise now. Hashem puts in his mouth, he's praising the Jewish people of the mitzvot that they do with the earth. And he says what? Mi mana, who can count? So the Rebbe says, you have an obvious question. You can count them. Hikshom of Arshim, all the commentaries ask this. Eich nitan loma, how can you say she'en cheshbon? That there is no calculation, no limit. The mitzvot she'en mekaymin be'avar, with the mitzvot that they do with the earth, there is a number to all of them. It doesn't go more than 613, a limited number. And there's certainly only a limited number. Actually, there's eight in total. Mitzvot that have to do with earth. Actually, just eight? Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, well, it could be more, but whatever it is, it's not limitless. There are 613 in total, and, and only a, a minority of them deal with the earth. So what does it mean? Ein cheshbon. There's no calculation. There is a calculation. The Yesh Lomar, so that answers a novel explanation here. Shekivanat chashibit varav, Rashi's intent in these words, ain quote, ein cheshbon be mitzvot. There is no calculating the mitzvot. Ein no, it's not. It's clearly not for the number of mitzvahs that are done with earth because there is a specific number. But, but if you look at those mitzvot, these mitzvahs are not just you do it once and that's it, but you can see it has an incredible ongoing effect. How so? He will now explain. This will also explain that there are others, which we won't go into now, but there are others. He only mentions these four. Because in them, more obviously, we can see this virtue. Just turn the page. How so? Again, these are mitzvahs that are not just you do once a year, once and so on, but they are continuous. How? Mitzvot lo tachrosh. Not to plow with an ox and a donkey. And not to plow mixed species. These are daily mitzvot. Right? When you're plowing your field, this is done every single day. Agriculture, which supports the entire population. There's this mitzvah associated every day. He does it with his ox, not with the ox and the donkey. He doesn't plow mixed species. These are present Call him out every time Shaddam Choresh Vizareh, every time he plows or he reaps at Sadeo, he's fulfilling a commandment not to do it this way. So it's not just that these are unlimited mitzvot, but these are mitzvot that there's no limit in the sense that they are virtually every day and continuous. Next, where do we see this in the red heifer? Mitzvot Efer uh, Apara, the, uh, the mitzvah of the ashes that's required for the red heifer. The Torah says you have to take a, a, a vial of it 
and put it away and keep it as a perpetual reminder in the Mishkan. Kol's man sha'if and natul mishmelet. It was always kept as a as a uh, to be guarded. Kedilat taher bot mei met in order to purify. So it's not just it was done once, but you had to keep the vial, not make it every time you need it. He was told make it and keep it, so it's around all the time. That's what he's saying. It's ever present. Yeah. Is it still present? It's hidden away. <coughs> it's hidden away in the, in the vault underneath the base of Mikdash. The original one that Moshe Rabbeinu made that vial. Yeah. And then, what about the sota that was only done as per need? It's a one-time deal. When it happened, you made the potion, she drank it. Where do we see that this ongoing effect? Answer. Mitzvat afar sota, the mitzvah of the, of the earth, in the, which was put into the potion of water and so on, that the sota would drink. Sheh emtsiota, through it, ha'isha nitara ba'ala. The hope is, and this happened obviously too, that she becomes pure. Her innocence is proven. Venikta venizra azara. She'll be, Torah says, if she's innocent, she'll be cleansed and she will bear child. So what's the result here? They're going to live together now for the rest of their life. Bless it. So this is also an ongoing effect in their family life and moreover, children, which will bear children, bear children. So that's also continuous. Matzava nimshach le'oret kol shnot chayehem. This is the result of drinking the salted waters, proven innocent. This has an effect. Otherwise, you can't be with her. That they live together. They come and living together. of the couple. And moreover, having children, children having children, that's continuous. So that's the answer here. It's not like that there's no limit to the mitzvahs done with the earth. It's these mitzvot, all of them have this unique property of they are not just done once and or per need, but they're constantly present. And the ripple effects. And every day that he plows his field, it's the mitzvah. Uh, the poraduma, it's not just make it when you need it. Make it and keep it always as a reminder. And for the, for the uh, sota, the result is lifelong and generations to come. Ad infinitum. Ad infinitum. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to add to you, I'll just say by uh, an insight, because we're not talking about it from the text, now a, a message to us. A deeper, a deeper meaning. There is no limit, begin the quote, there's no limit to the mitzvot that are done with earth. Now, symbolically, what does this mean? Not literally, now symbolically, on a, on a deeper level. There are two ways to do a mitzvah in general. One approach, or in general, in Judaism has two approaches. One, both observant and so on, but two tracks. One is, he does it because it makes sense. The appeal is the logic, the beauty, the morality, uh, and the, the wisdom in Torah. That's one level. Then there's another level where a person does so out of, a, out of accepting the yoke of heaven beyond rationale. It's called Kabbalat Ol. Like there's Naaseh and there's Nishma. Naaseh is whatever you say, whether we understand or not. He that is, accepts the yoke of heaven in surrender. And the, the other motivation is Nishma. He's fueled by the beauty and by the understanding. Now both are necessary. Obviously, you have to have nasa and nishma. But now separating the two and saying, you know, if it's only nas, only nishma, the basic conscious motivation is the logic, or consciously he's driven by the yoke of heaven, where's the difference? If a person is doing the mitzvot out of logic, then we see it's limited. Those mitzvot that make more sense, he's into more. Those he doesn't understand, he'll do so, but less enthusiastic. Moreover, the more he understands, the more he's going to be enthusiastic. So it's limited. But if his, it's, it's transcendent, his whole motivation is your will, then his enthusiasm and devotion is equal to all of them, not measured by his own appreciation. Now, earth is the symbol of humility. Earth is the symbol of, you will, will tread upon the earth, uh, humble like the earth, is the symbol of the second way, Serving God out of a sense of complete surrender. And that's a deeper meaning. There's no limit to the mitzvot done with the earth. The deeper meaning is that when a Jew does all mitzvot, now this is symbolic of all mitzvot, with the earth <coughs> model, surrender, self-transcendence, then there's no limit to his devotion, enthusiasm to all mitzvot, irrespective of whether they're logical or super logical. He understands, he doesn't, it appeals to his persona or doesn't. That's the deeper meaning. You follow?
So that's the meaning of En Cheshbon B'Mitzvot Sheim Bekamim Ba'afar. When a Jew does all the mitzvot, they are symbolic here. Ba'afar with the attitude of earth, I'm just earth. As, as Avrom actually said, I'm but earth and ashes before you. And uh, Moshe Rabbeinu said, what, what am I? Nothing. In this humility, then there's no limit. His devotion to God, there's no limit. There are no barriers. There's no, this is not for me, not now, whatever. There's no limit. It's, it's enthusiasm that transcends all boundaries. That's the deeper meaning of this statement. Gentlemen, have a wonderful day. Oh, yeah,